Happy late fall, early winter 2023 from the SMC Journal podcast. Thanks for joining me. This is the podcast that's all about uh, software engineering in today's modern IT. We talk about testing, tuning, observability, security, AI, and much, much more. I'm Scott Moore. I appreciate you being with me. Uh, We are going to continue the second part of a two-part podcast that we started last week that's titled Load Testing Like a Rockstar. And it's basically me sharing with you of my three decades of experience doing load testing, the things that I've learned, and trying to put it in a small uh, bundle of information that, especially for those of you just starting out, where do you begin? What's the proper process for doing load testing? Or at least what's the things that we know work and we can maybe improve on for our particular situation. Can you get us started, Scott, on a solid process that works, a solid methodology? And I I hesitate to say best practices because my best practices may not be your best practices, but I know that my practices actually do work for me. So maybe it's something that can help you and maybe steer you around a minefield here and there. Um, In this session, we're actually going to go deeper into uh, the the final pieces of, of, of the number of load tests that we run, the types of load tests, why we run them and what to expect, as well as the output that we expect, the value that we bring, and some actual real life stories and graphs uh, told in hopefully a humorous way. Before we get back into that presentation, let's talk about the sponsors that make this show possible for you to watch. This podcast is sponsored by SaltWorks Security. For almost 10 years, SaltWorks has delivered world-class application security services and products designed to help enterprises secure their applications from policy to production in an ever-changing security landscape. They're the makers of SaltMiner, an application security management platform designed by security professionals for security professionals. SaltMiner aggregates and normalizes the issues found by many different solutions and enriches that data with business context. SaltMiner gives team members from the C-suite, security, and development teams the ability to manage their application security program through customizable views. The SaltWorks SaltMiner Community Edition is a free penetration testing management and delivery application. It provides teams with custom reporting for potentially thousands of end users, red team support, and the ability to manage new and retesting of engagements. SaltMiner Community Edition also allows teams to enforce both testing methodologies and custom vulnerability databases for consistency in engagement delivery. Check them out today at saltworks.io. Do you need unbreakable network connectivity? West Networks can help. They're a leading provider of PepLink-based SD-WAN solutions, and they can help you achieve unbreakable connectivity by utilizing PepLink's SpeedFusion bandwidth bonding technology. Since 2012, West Networks has been assisting those in the mobile health services space by providing communities with access to life-saving technology. They also work with mobile command field units like first responders and news agencies, delivering faster and reliable access to mission-critical information all the time. Whether you're an IT professional who needs to work from anywhere or a full-time vacationing traveler in the RV community, West Networks can help you stay connected all the time from anywhere. Large enterprises can save up to 83% off cost while expanding communications and reliability beyond a single carrier with West Network's PepLink-based SD-WAN solutions. They can help you replace expensive MPLS connections with SpeedFusion site-to-site unbreakable VPN technology. So no matter what your needs are, West Networks can help you achieve unbreakable connectivity. Contact them today to learn more. I love you sponsors. Agent 503 back there is in love with you sponsors, and we really, really appreciate you, as well as all of you watching today. So let's get back into the second half of load testing like a rock star. So what would a scalability test be? Uh, Well, it's really 20% to 100% more of the 100% objective. In other words, don't stop at just your 100% objective because you might be right on the edge of falling over. You just don't know that you're at the edge of the cliff. So what I've always advised clients is best practice says any application should be able to withstand 200% of the worst possible conditions. And so if you think that a thousand concurrent users are your worst, you should be able to handle 2000. And that way you've got room to grow. Sometimes the company will tell me, well, we already know that we're growing at this rate and we we know one year from today, we will have 30% more traffic on average 
from what we do today. So we probably need to go ahead and test for that 30% additional to make sure we've got enough headroom. Do we need to add more servers? Do we need to add more memory or CPU to what we already have? That would be uh, the scalability objective. So in that case, if they know what they're going to try to reach in a year, I would do 130% of that objective, so 1,300 concurrent users. Or if you want to go all the way, I would go to 2,000 concurrent users and see the difference between the two, compare. If you only see a slight difference, but you're still meeting your service level objectives um, and your agreements, your contractual agreements, then you've got a pretty good, well-oiled machine, a great app, and there's no reason to not celebrate and put the thumbs up to everybody. Um, the number of times that I've been able to get that kind of result out of testing an application, I can probably count on a couple of hands. Uh, normally, we start seeing those patterns and those problems at that early top time transaction test, and then it just really gets worse from there. And there are some that never make it past the baseline, and then it goes into a big tuning engagement. So that's that's the main crux of this uh, this symphony of destruction, these types of tests that I run. But there's still a couple of more here. One is what we would refer to as a soak test or a volume test where we go beyond the one hour because it's not just about uh, depleting the resource of a CPU at the time. It could be a problem with a slow memory leak that happens over time that we wouldn't see in production for weeks or possibly even months, and then all of a sudden, we're suddenly having to reboot servers and we really don't know why. We want to find those type of problems early as well. So for that reason, if we can reach the 100% objective and it seems like everything's okay, run that test for a very long time and a very slow ramp up, a very long test, I would say eight hours, 10 hours, could be 20 hours, and then a very slow ramp down. Main goal is to try to see as we ramp up, we are consuming resources from our infrastructure. We hold those. Do we give all of those resources back as we begin to give up sessions and users on that system? If not, you're going to have problems in production. It's just a matter of time. So we can find out from a long period load test of a day, probably something that would take you a couple of months to figure out. And then by that time, people have rebooted the servers and it may be something that only occurs Every once in a while, when the right conditions happen, and since it's not repeatable in production, it just becomes this nagging thing where people get called on it and they just have to fix it whenever they do. So it'd be great to find that kind of problem out as early as possible. Now, stress testing is another one, but I always put an asterisk beside that test. It's a nice to have, but it's not always a must have. Why do I say that? Because a stress test may not give you the type of value or the information that you really want. So I can stress test an application by just throwing as much load as my load generators will push, as many virtual users as I can actually push out there as fast as possible. And usually in about 10 to 15 minutes, the application's down. The question is, when it goes down, what goes down first? And when we know that answer, what are we going to do about it? If you don't have a plan on what you're going to do when the web server goes down and you don't have a load balancer to put in front of it, so you can try two web servers or four web servers, you probably should get that plan established before you start doing some stress testing because it's really easy to figure out you know, what's going to fail. That, that stress test, really the objective is what is the first point of failure? And at least knowing that could be of some benefit, but you need to be able to take action after that. So that's why I put it as sort of an optional or nice to have. Most companies, when they ask for a load test, they're asking for a true um, mimicking of production as close to possible under the worst conditions, but realistic loads, not just slamming a bunch of load at you know the application. That's not very beneficial. And especially if you're not doing monitoring, all you're going to do is just get a few numbers and they're not really those numbers, those transaction times aren't necessarily um, of any value. They're not really good as soon as the test is over with. So remember, we're talking about actionable data. So one last thing about all of this, everything that I've mentioned in here really applies to 
integrated load testing. So this would be load testing that is done at a larger level when the app is ready to go to production. Not that it's going to hamper rolling it out to production, but it's not necessarily the same type of testing that you would do when we do what we call shift left testing. So that's where developers would begin to get early feedback about features that they're creating where they're putting amounts of load, probably not the same amount that we're putting in these type. This is for you know, the bigger test, but those earlier tests have a purpose. I mean, we want the early feedback so that we don't run into baselines where search is taking 30 seconds under a single user. That should have been caught earlier in the life cycle, and it should probably be part of a test that runs in a continuous fashion, like a continuous integrated environment. But those types of tests aren't the same types of tests that we would run in a much larger fashion because there are going to be things that slip through the cracks and that's what this type of testing is aimed to catch. So let's talk about a few interesting graphs and charts. This is actually, this colored chart of red actually comes from a product called Neoload. And this was an actual test that I ran. And it's pretty easy to see what the problem is from the red line. As we look at this trend line for the timings, that's what the red line is really showing is these timings. We actually see that it, as the worse it gets, the worse the color gets on the graph. That's by design in this tool. One of these actually gets up to 73 seconds. So we can back off earlier before all of that red stuff starts and say that's probably where our limitation is why is it so limited? Why can't we go any further in this? And not all the timings are that high, but there's this, that one, and then there's, there's another one that's about halfway in between. Why is that one so heavy? So this would be one where we would probably catch it as a top time transaction, and it's just going to get worse from here as we begin to, to ramp up. The next one I want to show you is... This is, again, another actual test that I run. And I've tried to minimize the, the view of the graph to only three different lines, three different data points. The first one at the top is as we ramped up the number of users to a certain point in time, we held them at that top line. And I think this was maybe uh, 100 users. So as you look at this, you'll see a, a the second line is the one that goes up and kind of it's a SQL connections line and it just kind of holds there. Once we get it to that point, it just holds and it just, there's a, there's a curve there. And then the view scorecard was the name of the transaction timing. You'll see that the scorecard just starts kind of good at the very beginning. But as we get into the test by about 10 minutes, all of a sudden we see this spike kind of goes down and it goes way up. And then as soon as we hit that SQL connection flattening point, the timing is just all over the place. One data point, it's way down. One data point, it's way up. So what's happening here? This, uh, this was an issue where the SQL server wasn't necessarily working that hard, but there was a hard-coded limit in the number of SQL connections. This is why monitoring is so important. So 100 was this default value. And while we could go probably more than 100 virtual users, it wasn't one user took up one SQL connection. Uh, once that number of SQL connections were reached, it, it, there was a pool of connections. Once that pool was full, so think about a swimming pool, nobody else can get in the pool. So when that happens, everything begins to go down. The application became unresponsive. So by playing around with just the setting and the value that's in that uh, configuration file, we were able to work with that and relieve this problem. But if you didn't have the SQL connections part, if you weren't looking at a database metric, you would not know just from ramping up the users why the view scorecard was so bad and going into the, you know, 100 second range before it kind of times out. And I think after 120 seconds, it just doesn't return anything. So this is why monitoring has to be part of all of your test. And then finally, I just thought this was a really funny graph where, where I call it bad data spikes. These were errors. This was actually an error graph that were only happening every once in a while. And the reason that we would see a spike in errors is because we were hitting bad data. We were given a data file uh, by 
the team that said, this is the data that you should use to do searches with and other things. And some of those values were just not good at all. They were actually causing those errors. And we had to actually go through the data file and pick out out of these thousands of records, the ones that were causing the problem. And all of a sudden this went away, but I just kind of added the falling man in there because I thought that was, that would be very cool. So you can't tell if the problem is related to bad data or the load level. Errors generally fail fast, producing short timings if handled gracefully. Errors that aren't cached by a CDN can cause the web server to work much harder. So my point is these errors that were happening, right? If it's every once in a while, look for a bad data file, not necessarily your application, unless it's only happening under load. This was happening during the entire duration of the test. So let's begin to wrap this up. If you create a symphony of destruction, a organized set of chaos with real world conditions, you will produce better software. And if you go through performance testing and load testing as a repeatable process, like what I've outlined, you will see good results. You will find those problems early in the life cycle. And you will show a massive value to your company. And that's how performance testers become rock stars. I always say that performance engineers should be the C-level's best friend, CIO, CTO, CIO, CEO, because we want the same thing that they want. We want They want low-risk software that's efficient, that performs well, that gives end users a great experience that they don't have to worry about when they roll it out, doesn't cost them so much. That's what they want. We want that by design. That's our job. And if you are of the mindset that I'm only going to do a load test and just provide some metrics to somebody and say it's your problem and not do anything more than that, you're, you're not going to have as much value to your company as you would as somebody who is producing these repeatable results with with additional like metrics and additional things that says, here's where we think the problem already is and working with that back end team to find that resolution quickly and being able to find those things that have slipped through the cracks on the shift left CI CD pipeline side. Well, there you have it, folks. That is my uh, go-to information. If anybody contacts me from this point forward and says, hey, Scott, how do I get started? I'm just going to send them to these two podcasts that we've done over the past couple of weeks and say, watch these. This is what I would tell you if I were with you face-to-face -face and you were paying me a lot of money on consulting to tell you this stuff. So I'm giving it away for free. Uh, I hope you liked the information, but even if you didn't, I'd love to hear from you. You can contact me through most social media. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the, the most uh, active that I'm on, but there's a QR code there. You can take it to my bio page and contact me through any of those ways listed on that page. And you can also just send me a quick email at heyscott at smcjournal.com. Let me know what you like, what you don't like. And some, uh, if you have additional questions, send me your questions and let me know. And maybe I'll address that on a future podcast. And if you do like this video, it would be great if you like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. That tells me that I'm doing the right thing concerning content. So with that, I hope that you are all rock stars now. You've got your guitars, basses, your drums, your xylophones, harmonicas, marimbas, trumpets, and whatever else you want to play. Gongas, maybe. And join the band and be a rock star uh, that you really are concerning load testing. Until the next SMC Journal podcast. This is Scott Moore saying thank you again for watching. Bye-bye.